We've all seen the population growth in our area. It's no surprise that with this growth, electricity consumption also increases. Your co-op wants our members to understand some of the challenges that utilities currently face managing this growth, locally, regionally, and across the nation. The term resource adequacy asks this question. Will there be enough power and transmission to maintain balanced supply and demand across the electric grid at all times? The current energy landscape presents challenges that must be managed carefully to keep our electric grid reliable. Nationwide, the energy industry is decreasing its reliance on fossil fuels to produce electricity in order to reduce emissions for the environment as we look towards a cleaner energy future. Coal plants are closing and natural gas is being restricted. Your co-op is fortunate to have access to reliable and carbon-free electric generation from the Federal Columbia River hydropower system. Hydro is one of the most reliable resources because it is able to ramp electricity generation up or down instantly to meet demand. This is why it's called baseload generation. However, some groups would like to remove dams in the federal hydropower system, which would decrease the carbon-free baseload generation available to the Northwest. At the same time that electric baseload generation is decreasing, electric demand is increasing. Not only is our population growing and adding new electric services to our grid, but more and more products than ever are electrically powered. Robot vacuums, electric lawnmowers, and vehicles. The Northwest has also seen enormous load growth from data centers across the region. Adequate generation is not the only challenge. We also need to quickly develop the transmission infrastructure to physically move electricity across the grid to where it's needed. Significant hurdles exist to siting, building, and paying for the necessary new electric generation and transmission resources needed to keep the lights on in the future. So what is your co-op doing about these challenges? We are always working to keep power affordable and reliable. We are also working to help shape our energy future. Here are some ways we're approaching resource adequacy issues. We are proactively performing upgrades and investing in system modernization to accommodate growth and enhance reliability. We are continually investigating new ways to add power to our grid and exploring new generation projects with local and regional partners. Here in the Flathead Valley, some of our innovative generation projects include our community solar projects, our partnership with Stoltz Land and Lumber Company's biomass facility, and our landfill gas to energy plant, which turns your garbage into electricity. Finally, we're committed to working with you, our member owners. We want you to be empowered to use energy efficiently and reduce your demand. That's why we have rebate and incentive programs for energy efficient upgrades in your home or business, as well as low interest loans to help pay for eligible projects. We are also testing and developing new programs to help members easily reduce their electrical demand. Using electricity more efficiently and reducing demand during your co-op's peak hours is a win-win situation. When you can shift your electric usage to outside of our grid's peak hours, you help to reduce strain on the grid we all share, and you can lower your electric bill. That's the power of partnership. Your co-op will continue to work with members, policymakers, and other partners to ensure that we are collectively managing growth in a sustainable manner. It is evident that demand for electricity is increasing and will continue to increase. As we navigate these challenges, your co-op will continue researching, advocating, and acting on your behalf to maintain your access to reliable, affordable electricity. Learn more about how you can help. flatheadelectric.com slash energy solutions.
So my name is John Hansen, and I'm Field Operations Supervisor. My name is Al Thorson. I'm the Operations Superintendent. I've been doing line work for 37 years. So I've been working in the electrical industry for 31 years. When I'm out in the field on a storm, you know, I get stopped by people saying, you know, how long is it going to be? The main goal in an outage is to restore power safely to the greatest number of members in the shortest time possible. So how do we do that? We do that by prioritizing the sequence of events. The first thing that FEC crews are tasked with is assisting local fire departments and first responders with emergency situations. First priority is safety. Working alongside the volunteer fire departments that are out assisting in uh, storm situations. There's wires down, sparking wires, uh, car, wires on cars, all of that. And so we have to respond to those things to kind of relieve the fire departments. We get guys out there to, to take care of those dangerous situations and try to clear all those up first. The transmission lines supply power to substations, which then distribute power to thousands of members. So these lines would receive top priority if affected by an outage. Second priority would be transmission lines in our substations. How many substations do we have down or do we have any substations out? So then we try to get out there and get the transmission line cleared up so that we can get our substation back on. Next, crews would make any needed repairs at those substations, followed by repairing transformers and distribution lines. Third priority would be repairing our distribution system. We try to get as much of the line cleared off so that we can heat the circuit up and you know then we go back and and start uh, you know repairing you know where the where the lines are down and the holes are still okay. Fourth priority would be situations where additional crews are needed, poles down, wire down, stuff that's a little more labor intensive. Where the poles are down, then we kind of have to come back to town and regroup, get different equipment, get different people called out. It's just a longer process. We prioritize this way when we can, but it's important to note that this process is not an exact science. The nature of this work requires our crews to be flexible and change their course as unexpected issues arrive. Every outage situation is different. There's numerous unknowns. Sometimes the poles aren't, aren't in very good places and you know you gotta take fences down. One thing that is consistent is that co-op crews often braving dangerous weather conditions and working through the night do everything they can to restore power as quickly and safely as possible. NRECA Youth Tour to Washington, D.C. A free trip of a lifetime. What if I told you that a short essay could be your ticket to a flight across the country and the chance to see dozens of landmarks, museums, and maybe even take in a Major League Baseball game in Washington, D.C.? It's really that easy. Each year, electric cooperatives from across the state send dozens of high school students to the nation's capital for a week of sightseeing, learning about our nation's history, meeting our senators and members of Congress, making new friends and having a lot of fun. What really touched me was our tour of Capitol Hill and being able to meet with our state representative and senators that really I don't know, was a moment for me that I probably wouldn't have anywhere else, especially not at this age. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome to Flathead Electric's 87th annual members meeting and its first annual meeting and energy expo. I am Gary Bowe, president of your board of trustees, and I will preside over the meeting today. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now I would like to introduce my peers on the board, but first I want to recognize our general manager, Mark Johnson, our assistant general manager of engineering, operations, and power, 
Jason Williams, our Assistant General Manager of Administrative Services, Leah Robin, and our Executive Assistant, Cindy Crosswhite. Your trustees are District 1, Stacy Schnabel, Vice President. District 2, Jake Van, Jake Van Houten. District 4, Steve Strike. District 5, Alan Ruby. District 6, Dwayne Broughton. District 7, myself, Gary Bow, President. District 8, Gary Bygren, Secretary Treasurer, and District 9, Harry Crooks. Our Secretary Treasurer, Jerry Bygren, thank you. Our Secretary Treasurer, Jerry Bygren, will now read the notice of the meeting and proof of mailing and establish our quorum. Good afternoon. Uh, I, Jerry Bygren, am Secretary of Flathead Electric Cooperative here at and after called the Cooperative to hereby certify that on the 26th day of March 2024, the Cooperative mailed 10,064 postcard notices of the annual meeting to be held uh, April 18, 2004, members of the Cooperative. By depositing such a notice with the prepaid postage thereon addressed aforesaid United States mail and attached notice is a true and copy, true cop, true and correct copy of said notice of said meeting. On the 26th day of March 2024, the co op also sent 45,626 notifications of the annual meeting to be held April 18th, 2024, via email informing members of the annual meeting. A total number of members present on this 18th day of April 2024 is currently uh, 529 members, and that was at 5 16 p.m. Thank you, Jerry. In your welcome bags, you received the minutes of the last annual meeting held on April 22nd, 2023. If there's no objection, we will dispense with the reading of these minutes. Are there any corrections to these minutes? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I have a motion, a second. Then moved and seconded that we uh, uh, motion that, that we uh, approve the minutes. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Opposed, say no. Motion passed. Thank you. We'll move on with the co-op's financial report. We will hear from Aaron Clayton, a partner with ID Bailey, via video. Hi, my name is Aaron Clayton and I'm here on behalf of Ide Bailey. Ide Bailey was hired by the Board of Trustees to complete an audit of the financial statements as of and for the years ended December 31st, 2023 and 2022. Ide Bailey works on behalf of the Board of Trustees who serve the membership of Flathead Electric Cooperative. We report back to the Board of Trustees on the results of our financial statement audit of Flathead Electric Cooperative. We have audited the financial statements of Flathead Electric Cooperative, which comprise the balance sheets as of December 31st, 2023 and 2022, and the related statements of operations, equities, and cash flows for the years then ended and the related notes to the financial statements. In our opinion, the financial statements referred to present fairly in all material respects, the financial position of Flathead Electric Cooperative as of December 31st, 2023 and 2022, 
and the results of its operations and its cash flows for the years then ended in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. We want to thank Flathead Electric Cooperative for the opportunity to work with your organization and to present the audit information to the membership as part of your annual meeting. Thank you. It's wonderful, wonderful to hear from our auditor that our cooperative is in excellent financial health. Is there a motion to accept the audit report and the financial statement? We've got a motion, a second, then moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Vice President Schnabel will turn now to the other key focus of our annual meeting, our election. Good evening. Co-ops are not-for-profit, autonomous, self-help organizations governed by their members. Co-op members elect other members to serve on the board of trustees that conducts the cooperative's business. Elected trustees ensure democratic control by overseeing the co-op's operational decisions, financials, and agreements entered with other organizations or government entities. Regardless of which of the co-op's district you reside in, you have the right to vote each year for all trustees running for election. Three trustees are up for election this year. In the ballots you receive, you will be asked to vote for a trustee in each of the districts. Per the bylaws, the nomination committee has reviewed and validated the nominating petitions and signatures. You have the option to vote electronically or via paper ballot. Complete directions on how to vote are included in your annual meeting and Energy Expo guidebook and are also available on Flathead Electric Co-op's website. For now, please know that e-ballots will be sent to you electronically on April 19th, that's tomorrow, and paper ballots were mailed on April 16th. Our bylaws require these elections to be held each year, regardless of whether they are contested. We encourage you to get to know the candidates running to represent you. Their bios and a video they've recorded to let you know why they are running are all available via QR code uh, in your guidebook and also on the co-op's website. You can also view these videos outside in the Energy Expo at the elections booth upstairs. Thank you very much for participating in your co-op's democratic process. Thank you, Stacy. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's expert speakers. We want our members to be aware of the issues that impact the affordable, reliable electricity we enjoy, enjoy in Northwest Montana. We've asked Mark Johnson, General Manager of Flat Electric Cooperative, and Dr. Pat Barkey, Director of the University of Montana's Bureau of Business and Economic Research to talk with you about the state of the energy industry and specific electric issues impacting your co-op and the greater Flathead Valley. Dr. Barkey, the floor is yours. Good evening, thank you for inviting me to the meeting. Um, I'm here as an economist and as a uh, someone who tracks the state economy to look at a really important problem, and that's electricity reliability. And uh, we got involved in this particular issue uh, because of what you see on this sign, which of course is what happened in Texas uh, just a couple of years back when they had a catastrophic failure of their grid, which took them down for many, many days, caused billions of dollars of damage, and also caused uh, death and suffering across the state. Uh, this issue of, of electric reliability surprised a lot of people there. Uh, there are a lot of people who are unaware of the challenges that the electric grid faces today, and that includes Montana. And so we undertook a study, a new project, we called it, as you can see, this Montana Electricity Reliability Initiative, to just barge our way into this debate 
as a not an insider. Uh, we're not a utility, nor are we a regulator. We're just some researchers that care about the economy. And we wanted to take a look at reliability from the perspective of the economy because we don't think that respect that perspective is necessarily given the attention it's due. Uh, quite frankly, the bottom line of this, and this is a very summary uh, presentation, the bottom line is that we all need to do more work to be more aware of the issues facing Montana in particular and the country as a whole so that we can actually be involved and have a voice in some of the debates that are taking place. So what did we do in this study? We looked at the infrastructure of the state and we looked at the generation and transmission across the state. So it's not a study of this area per se, but it looks at the entire state, which itself is a little unusual and that most reliability analysis is done for individual providers, people who have commitments to serve customers. But we thought of the economy as the entire state. And so we looked at, at we took a fresh look at all of the generation, which you can see by these circles here, with the colors being the different kinds of fuels, as well as the major transmission corridors. We didn't look at distribution, the drop downs to homes and businesses and so forth. But the, uh, the generation and transmission infrastructure of the entire state, that's what we're looking at because it takes time. As we know, it takes time to address capacity and reliability issues. We have to get out in front of these kinds of problems. And as, as wide ranging as this is, and of course we're a, we're a huge state geographically, it's important to note that this is just the state of Montana. Of course, we ship power elsewhere and many other customers within Montana, especially in this part of the state, uh, get their power from outside the state. So these remarks really are, are pretty broad, but they talk about the entire, the entire state, but there's actually even more to it with the region. So, we're really doing uh, a lot of work. We're adding up a lot of companies, call them load serving entities. These are companies that have a responsibility to serve customers. And this shows you what gets the attention in the state because this biggest bar when you do customer counts of these load serving entities is of course Northwestern Energy. They have the most customers, but look who's number two. Uh, you folks right here. And then you see there's a large number of some of these uh, entities uh, serve less than uh, 1,000 customers. But when you put them all together, these are the individual entities that have the responsibility for serving customers. What kind of environment do they face, all right? Well, let's first take a look at the demand for electricity. And it makes sense, we're worried about the future, so it makes sense to look at where we've come from. What are the trends in electricity? And really there's, as many of you know in this room, uh, there are really two dimensions to this. First is the electricity in kilowatt hours, the energy, what you, what you pay your bill on, what you're billed on. And when you look at the trend, and this is by different customer types, but focus on that red line. It's overall electricity sales in Montana, the entire state, not Flathead, not you know, uh, East and so forth. It's the entire electricity sales of the state a little irregular. There was a lot of little wonkiness that happened during COVID, of course. That was a profound time for all of us and impacted the electric grid. But it's not too hard to tell from this graph that this is going up, all right? And in fact, it's going up for most customer classes, which is what those other lines indicate. There's another dimension to this, though, which I think it's important, as I said, as we ramp up our understanding of the issues involved in this debate, it's important to note that electricity is not like bread, all right? If you run out of bread, if you go to the store and they don't have bread, you go get some tomorrow or you go to another store, et cetera. If there's not elect electricity every minute, every hour, every day, if there's more being demanded from a, from a system than is being provided, that can be catastrophic. And in fact, that's exactly ultimately what happened in places like Texas and indeed California, I didn't mention them. So there's this uh, concept known as peak demand. So peak demand is just that, it's the instantaneous demand for electricity during a peak time. And sometimes this is done for a season, it's done for a day, a month, et cetera. This is a look at peak demand for two seasons of the year, uh, summer and winter. I have a uh, malicious grad assistant who uh, made winter 
red and some are blue just to confuse me when I get up in front of rooms like this. Uh, we're, we're still a winter peaking state. And the reason why this is important is because this is what planners have to plan for. They have to plan for that maximum with a safety margin in case there's, you know, the assets aren't available and so forth. So you look at that, and again, those dotted lines are there to help you understand that both of these are trending up, all right? Now, there's a lot of things going on behind the curtain here in terms of efficiency, population growth, economic growth. Our, our study gets into all that, but that's the bottom line. We have increasing demand. What do we have in terms of supply? Well, again, let's take a look at two different ways of looking at it. And I think this is, you know, these graphs are busy. I appreciate that. But there's, there's, there's a return for trying to understand a little bit of what's going on with these graphs, other than admiring the pretty colors. Um, on the left-hand side is the actual generation in the state of Montana, all right, by fuel type. So the black is coal, the blue is hydro, uh, the green is wind, and, and there's uh, some other colors there for, for solar and for uh, uh, petroleum. And so if you look at that, and you look at what it totals to, you can see that there's a little bit of stagnation, maybe a little downward trend, and a definitely fall off in 2020, which is, of course, when the two units one and two of Coal Strip uh, went down, uh, were taken offline. So we have less generation. Now, what I mean by generation is the same thing like I did with your energy bill. This is the actual amount of energy produced, added up over the entire year, gigawatt hours, if you will. On the right-hand side is something that's tossed around quite a bit, and this is something called capacity. So capacity, I like to think of as like the speedometer on your car, the number that the highest number there. Supposedly that's as fast as your car can go. Uh, capacity of different generation types, you can see is there. It's much smoother, much less irregular. And capacity tells a slightly different story. In terms of capacity, uh, the, you still see a fall off in 2020 but not necessarily a line down. And this is important because not all kinds of energy generation deliver their capacity all the time, thinking mostly of the intermediate ones. So our study took a look at the last 10 years of peaks, system peaks in Montana over a 10 year period. And we asked ourselves for all these dots all around the state, and you can't see them all, some of them are big, some of them are small, some are wind, some are coal, some are gas, et cetera. What percent on average over that 10 year period of their capacity, their rated output, their maximum, a high spot on their speedometer, what percent did they actually deliver? All right. And these were the findings. All right. Coal, about 74%. Uh, hydro, 54%. A lot of reasons for that. Individual stories, uh, peaks during the winter. Uh, but then you see natural gas, 35%. Uh, natural gas is smaller here. A lot of that has to do with way, the way that particular resource is managed. And wind is about 10%. All right. So when we throw around these capacity numbers and we talk about we're replacing this with this and, and we're talking about the capacity of what we're retiring and what we're replacing, keep in mind the fact that capacity is only one dimension of power availability. It doesn't necessarily tell you what's available when you most need it. Uh, the bottom line, and I am really going through this at warp speed, but the bottom line is that Montana has had a history, especially since the 70s, of being an electricity exporting state. Ever since the four units of coal strip came online in the 70s and the 80s, uh, we have shipped power to other states net. This busy graph shows what's happened since then, all right? It is a wild line going up and down uh, that is the measure of net energy flows into and out of the state of Montana. Almost all the time, that wild line over these years, this goes back to 2015, I think, almost all, all the time, this, uh, this line is above zero. So we're net exporting. But, you know, you run into a day every now and then where maintenance is being done, et cetera, and we needed to import more power than we than we actually uh, uh, export it. But notice the trend in that line. It's clearly going down. We are trending, as you can see from the title of the slide, to becoming neutral and possibly even an importer of electricity. 
uh, to be joined, by the way, with many other states in the West, most notably California, which in some years has imported 40% of its power needs. So where are we looking in the future? Well, in the future, we have this extra challenge when it comes to generation, and that is the announced retirement of coal-fired generation. And here I've broadened the scope to look at the region. So across the Northwest region, these bars and that dotted line talk about all of the retirements in the different states you can see in this legend, the different retirements that have been announced. They, they may actually happen before then. We know there's a lot of political headwinds for some of these facilities, but nonetheless, what's actually announced. And when you add it all up, it's, it's a rather stunning amount of power that's set to be retired. And of course, there are plans to replace it. And uh, I don't have time to go into all those, but I wanna bring you uh, up to date on one other challenge that doesn't get as much ink and really needs to be brought to all of our attention. And that is the transmission system. Montana is a spread out state. We're connected to other states and indeed Canadian provinces. That's a great thing. That's something that gives us resilience. That's something that gives us extra capacity when we need it. And not unimportantly, it also gives us markets to ship our extra electricity when we have it, which helps keeps our, our, our companies in the black. However, when you look at the highway for electrons, if you will, that Montana is served by, uh, that highway is full of potholes. And what I mean by that is that these transmission corridors, and there's seven of them listed here, and they are the major pathways that Montana both ships out and ships in electricity, those corridors are congested uh, and what I mean by that, and that's this bit rather busy table to the right, uh, takes a look at the percent of time that the wires on these corridors are being used to more than 75% of the rated capacity. When you start getting beyond 75% of what a transmission line can take, you start getting worried. You start getting worried about heat loss, component failure, you know, wires drooping, all kinds of issues that could be there. So you see all those red squares there for the four seasons of the year and the seven transmission quarters. Those are the times and the quarters that Montana's pathways are stressed more than the regional average. Regional average, anywhere between five and 7%. Some of the pathways in Montana up to and, and exceeding 25% uh, at times for the worst case. So this, clearly needs to be addressed. What are we doing? Are we building new transmission lines? Uh, you hear a little about that, but you don't really see that much being done. So I think this is a good spot to transition because the Flathead Valley is really no stranger to transmission bottlenecks. And I think now it's appropriate to, uh, to focus now on how these statewide issues apply to this area and the Flathead Electric Co-op. So I'm delighted to uh, bring up uh, Flathead Electric Cooperative General Manager, Mark Johnson. Mark. Good evening, my name is Mark Johnson. I'm the general manager here at Flathead Electric. I wanna welcome you to Flathead Electric's 87th annual meeting and Energy Expo, that's pretty exciting. I owe a debt of gratitude to both the staff and trustees for our gathering today. As you can tell, a lot of work went into this program and I'm sure there has been a lot of sleepless nights for our staff uh, who have done an incredible job pulling this event off. I wanna particularly thank our communications team, Katie, Courtney, Sherilyn, and Will, who spearheaded the design and execution of today's meeting. We thought the drive up annual meeting a few years ago at Glacier High School was a challenge. Believe me, that was a cakewalk compared to this. So I'm really appreciative of all the work they've done. I wanna thank the board for giving us a, the chance to change up our traditional Saturday morning annual meeting and allow us the opportunity to shake things up a little bit and try something new. So how about a hand for our staff and board who have made the event so special? I also want to thank Dr. Barkey for joining us today. The information he presented should be an alarm bell for all of us. And I want to build on the regional electric supply perspective he presented and focus it primarily on Flathead Electric. 
We have significant growth here in the Flathead, no matter how you slice it. You can see that the growth here. Since 2018, both our overall system peak load and our meter counts have grown considerably. However, that difference in load has grown at 120 megawatts at th or 37% in that time, while our meter counts have only grown 14%, which means our members are using more energy than they have in the past. The Bonneville Power Administration, or BPA, our power and transmission provider, has told us that their transmission system is limited to 527 megawatts. So we are already 84% of the way to that limit with no end to our growth in sight. This slide really puts the growth we have experienced into perspective. The green dots represent the new services we have installed over the past five years. And you can see that the growth has occurred all over the Flathead Valley in Libby. There are not many areas we serve that have not seen some level of substantial growth. Adequate transmission, as Dr. Barkey mentioned, is critical to delivering reliable power. As you might expect, building transmission is a time consuming and very expensive process. This graph shows that BPA, our transmission provider, was highly active in building high voltage transmission lines in, in the 1960s and the 70s and the 80s. But they have built only minimal transmission since, especially when you consider the amount of regional population growth as well as the societal transition to the electrification of everything. The BPA transmission lines that serve our area, like the transmission lines you see near Costco and Lowe's, cost anywhere from $1.5 to $2 million per mile to build, not to mention the time and effort it takes to do the required environmental impact assessments, to obtain the necessary permits, acquire the appropriate land rights, and to find the construction companies to do the build. So what is Flathead Electric doing to make sure your co-op stays strong into the future? How are we addressing the electric supply adequacy challenges noted by Dr. Barkey? First, we are continually improving the distribution system by converting overhead lines to underground to minimize weather-related outages, as well as doing the necessary tree trimming to avoid tree-related outages and minimize the potential for wildfires. In the last few years, we have implemented a wildfire mitigation plan and also a vegetation management plan that help guide our right-of-way work. Next, we continue to pursue the multitude of federal and state grant opportunities that are currently available. Flathead Electric has already been awarded multi-million dollar grants that we plan to invest in our distribution system to increase system reliability and take advantage of the most up-to-date technological advantages in our industry. And we are not done. We will continue to seek more grant opportunities if they benefit our members. We have also stepped up our government affairs presence, enhancing our relationship with our local, state, and federal legislators, because the issues we are facing politically are considerable. From removing hydroelectric dams and other critical baseload generation resources, creating reliability concerns, to secret government agreements that negatively impact our members' access to clean, affordable, and reliable hydropower, to dealing with the challenges presented by intermittent generation resources like wind and solar, we and many of the region's public power associations that we partner with stand ready to defend your rights. Thank you. Another area we continue to focus on is educating our members. We recently revised our website to be more user friendly and we continue to add more educational content. Our monthly publication, Light Reading, is designed to make you aware of relevant topics facing the cooperative. Our use of various social media outlets allows us to provide timely content that might be obsolete if provided via any other platform. Ultimately, our hope is that we reach you where you are without inundating you with too much information. I want to go back and talk a little bit more about BPA's transmission lines into the Flathead Valley. We continue to put pressure on BPA to maintain an adequate amount of available transmission capacity in our area. I can tell you that we are having success working with BPA on transmission enhancements to their lo local Flathead Valley transmission system that serves both Flathead Electric and Lincoln Electric, our friends to the north. We have had multiple meetings with BPA transmission planners and engineers and based on those meetings, we believe we will eventually see additional transmission lines 
built by BPA in the next five to 10 years, which will increase the amount of power delivered to the Northwest Montana area. Lastly, our board and management spend a significant amount of time working on power supply issues. In fact, it has been the primary strategic planning topic for as long as I can remember. Over the past two years, we have been working with BPA on the next BPA power contract that will start October 1st, 2028. Flathead Electric staff attend all BPA workshops and we provide oral and written comments, sometimes supportive, sometimes critical, making sure we protect the statutory rights of our members to their low cost BPA preference power. Along with 17 other Northwest Electric cooperatives, Flathead Electric belongs to the Pacific Northwest Generating Cooperative or PNGC, which is a generation and transmission cooperative whose sole purpose is to provide power to its members, including developing and owning generation resources with the goal of minimizing the electricity supply concerns highlighted by Dr. Barkey. As you can imagine, it's tough to develop large scale generation of any type, especially in the Flathead Valley, where you have the backdrop of Glacier National Park to the north and Flathead Lake to the south. Finding enough land and the willingness of a community to allow development of a natural gas plant or multi-acre solar or wind farm would be extremely difficult. As a member of PNGC, we will be able to partner with our fellow 17 electric cooperatives throughout the region to develop baseload 24 seven generation resources to the scale required that would be almost impossibly to do locally by ourselves. As you can see with this graphic, Flathead Electric remains vigilant, ensuring that you have access to low cost and dependable power when you need it. But all this work comes with a price. Each year, Flathead Electric engages in months of financial analysis and forecasting, which includes annual budgeting, a 10-year financial forecast, a cost of service analysis, and designing electric rates that fairly allocate the costs of running the cooperative to our different and diverse member classes. After reviewing all the data and considering the financial position of the cooperative both now and into the future, Flathead Electric's Board of Trustees recently approved a 2.8% overall rate increase for electric bills issued on or after June 1st, 2024. You can see that in prior to this year, or you can see prior to this year that Flathead Electric's rate was increased slightly in 2023, and this followed five straight years of no, over, no overall rate increases. When you compare the change in our rates to some of the price increases we have seen for the goods and services we all use on a daily basis, our rate changes are very low. And remember, our residential electric rates are designed to give you some control over your monthly electric bill by giving you the opportunity to shift your usage from the times in the morning and late afternoon when power prices are at their highest to other times of day when power prices are lower, saving you and the cooperative money. To give you an idea of the inflation we are seeing, in 2019, we paid $40,000 for a half-ton pickup truck. This year, for that same truck, we paid over $55,000, an increase of 38%. In 2019, we could buy a bucket truck for $290,000 that would take 24 months to be delivered. This year, that same bucket truck is $485,000 and will take 36 to 48 months to be delivered. I'm sure many of you are seeing similar hikes and drawn out delivery times at your businesses as well. We recognize that many of our members are sensitive to any price increase, and that is why our board and staff work hard to keep retail electric rates as low as possible while maintaining the high level of member service you've come to expect. At the end of the day, I can attest that every trustee and employee at Flathead Electric recognizes that we are here to serve you, our members but the challenges we have in front of us are daunting. I say this every year and I hope it is sinking in, but we cannot do this alone. We need your help. Please consider joining our grassroots program and we will keep you abreast of all of the critical issues. Remember that our website at flatelectric.com is full of up-to-date tools and information to help and ed educate you. And I also wanna put a plug in for our My Co-op app that you can download to your phone that app contains valuable information about the cooperative, your energy usage, and your account. Thank you again for joining us at the new and improved annual meeting and energy expo. 
I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with us today. And I'll now turn it back over to Gary before I draw today's grand prize, a $500 bill credit. Thank you. That, that was wonderful. Let's give a round of applause to Pat and Mark for helping us better understand the electricity issues in our area. Well, I have the floor. I want to go off script for a moment to recognize a major milestone for our general manager. Next week, Mark Johnson will have been with the cooperative for 25 years. <clears throat> he has served as general manager for over 10 of those years. Mark is an incredible asset to the co-op's members. Not very many cooperatives are led by a person with Mark's deep industry knowledge, intellect, and ethics. On top of that all, he is a kind guy who makes hard work enjoyable. Please join me in thanking Mark and honoring his commitment to Flathead Electric Cooperative with a round of applause. <laughs> there being no other business to come before the assembly, I declare a recess. The board will reconvene on May 20th at the Kalispell office, at which time the election will be certified. Now that the business meeting is over, Mark Johnson is going to draw the grand prize. After the winner is announced, please enjoy the Energy Expo as you make your way to dinner, which is being served upstairs in the gymnasium. Thank you so much for joining our new annual meeting and Energy Expo, and please give us the feedback about the changes to our meeting. You'll receive a survey via email, or you can scan the QR code on the screen now. Uh, now our dinner table's upstairs uh, to take it uh, tonight. Thanks again. Thank you very much for the kind round of applause. I really appreciate it. It's been a great 25 years at Flathead Electric. Uh, best move I ever made start, to start working at Flathead. Um, really appreciate a round of applause. Thank you very much for that. Um, I will go over here and I'll spin the wheel. I'm, this will be my first time ever being the uh, prize guy. I, I, it looks simple. I hope I don't mess it up. So here we go. Okay, the winner of the $500 bill credit is Sandra Dyer. Is Sandra here? Is she here? Okay. All right. Congratulations, Sandra. So, Sandra, if you could please... Is she, is she up in the balcony? Okay. Uh, D-Y-E-R. Is that, is that you? <laughs> is, is, Sandra, is Sandra Dyer here? I'll give her last call, then I'll go draw another name. All right, I'll do this again. Okay, the winner is Sue Meskimen. Sue Meskimen. Okay, I'm fired. I am not doing very good. Where's Ross Holter at? I want his him back as prize guy. Uh, 
Third time's a charm. Carrie Morgan. All right, Carrie, congratulations. So Carrie, if you could please come up here when we're done and we'll get you your uh, certificate. And I just a couple things, we're gonna serve dinner for the first time ever after this and I appreciate you guys being here again. Thank you so much. Um, hope you enjoyed our expo. It was a lot of work and, and hopefully you got some information and learned a few things. We're going to we're going to do dinner. We're going to excuse the balcony first just so we don't have a stampede up there that since they're on the upper deck. So just give them a few minutes and then we'll do the lower uh, lower area. And again, thank you so much. Um, the curtain is going to close. We're going to meet you guys out in dinner here shortly. So please enjoy the dinner and thank you again for making making the trip here and spending time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. 